So I want to talk about um, something that I'm calling generative design. And when I use that term generative, I mean life-serving. It's very much what, what, Gus, what Gus talked about. And we, we can contrast it with uh, what I call extractive design, which is the aim of extracting maximum financial income. Now, now generative design is a big territory. You can, you can see in there employee ownership, uh, cooperatives, community banks, community development corporations, social enterprise, hybrids, and also some non-corporate forms like community land trusts or conservation easements. Now, there's also something in this territory that I call the mission-controlled corporation, and that, that's what I want to talk about today. And these are large enterprises that are um, that have a serious living mission, a social mission, and um, there is a control. That that mission is in control. So let's let, let me talk a little bit about um, you know what makes these different generative designs a single genotype, you know, a single family. And there are four or five actually design elements. And briefly, those are purpose, ownership, governance, capital, and networks. Now I'll talk a little bit about each of these elements as I go through some examples. Um, the first. The first element that's absolutely essential is living purpose. A generative design aims to meet human needs. It's about producing beneficial products and serving the common good. It's about having a positive impact on the community. And these companies are often profitable, and generally are, but profit's a means to an end, not an end in itself. Now, purpose is the DNA, and there are other ownership elements that bring that purpose to life and hold it in place. So the first example I'll talk about is the John Lewis Partnership. This is the largest department store chain in the UK. It has revenues of about $7 billion, and it also owns a chain of 200 organic supermarkets. There are 70,000 employees in this firm, and it's 100% employee-owned. Its stated purpose is to serve employee happiness, which is really rather remarkable uh, kind of purpose. Now, to protect this mission, it uses a bicameral governance design. So there is an employee, um, employees directly elect their own partnership council, which is separate from the board of directors. So in this model, we see purpose, we see ownership, and we see governance at work. Those are the three design elements. It always takes at least, um, you, you need purpose and you need at least one more design element, I think, to make an effective uh, generative design. Now let's talk about a second design element, and that is governance. Um, uh, let me back up for a moment and say ownership is held in living hands. This is the characteristic here. It could be ownership by a family, by employees, by customers, by a nonprofit, by a foundation. Uh, but somewhere there are people engaged in the life of the firm who are holding our ownership. It's living ownership. So the second element is living governance. And here I'll talk about Novo Nordisk. Now this is a company in Denmark. It's the world's largest maker of insulin. Their revenues are $10 billion, and there's 31,000 employees at this firm. Its mission is to defeat diabetes. As far as I can tell, that's a pretty uh, genuine mission. And it's foundation controlled. So this is a firm that's publicly traded. Uh, you and I could go out and invest in it tomorrow, but its, it's uh, controlling shares are held by a foundation. And the executives have to report every year to this foundation on how they're meeting social and environmental goals as well as financial goals. So here we see uh, two elements. We see mission and we see control. And I would say that um, foundation-controlled companies are, are common throughout Northern Europe. Now, I wouldn't say they're all uh, generative designs. They don't all have a living purpose. But there's certainly the potential is there. All right. So then a third design element is um, um, the relationship to capital. So we talked about ownership. We talked about purpose. 
talked about governance. This is the fourth design element, relationship to capital. And capital is, is a friend uh, rather than a master. So he, here I would point to Organic Valley. This is one of the four largest organic brands in the U.S. It has revenues of about $500 million. It's owned by a cooperative. And it's a cooperative of the 1,600 organic family farms that produce this company's milk, cheese, and eggs. Now, um, the purpose of this company is to save the family farm. And in order to do that, it aims to pay its suppliers as much as possible, which is the exact opposite of what most companies try to do, which is to pay suppliers as little as possible. I met with uh, CEO George Seaman, and he told me, we don't have much need for profits over about 2%. We'd, We'd rather give it to the farmers. Now, they raise capital in part through preferred stock. Uh, preferred stock, as you may know, behaves like equity, and yet it performs like it, it appears like equity on your books, and yet it performs like debt. And they pay 6% annually on that. So they're able to get capitalization into this, into this firm without giving up control. I would add that two-thirds of the agricultural products in, in this country are organized uh, through cooperatives, are distributed through cooperatives. So it's, it's a surprisingly large sector. And in Europe, cooperative banks hold 21% of all deposits. There's a large bank called Rabobank in the Netherlands, which holds 43% of that country's deposits. So cooperatives are, are working on a very large scale, and we'll hear more about that today. There's a final piece I'll talk about, and that is networks, networks of ethical practice or or communities of practice. And here I would point to the New York Times. Now, this is another mission-controlled company. In this case, it's controlled by a family, the Oaks Salzberger family. It has revenues of about $3 billion. It is publicly traded, and yet the family controls the board of directors. They have super voting shares that enable them to control the board. <clears throat> now, the mission of this company is to create an informed electorate. And I think we know that this is a company that takes very seriously its mission of excellence in, journal- uh, in journalism. And Rupert Murdoch would dearly love to take over this company, and he can't uh, because of a single design element, and that is the super voting shares that the family controls. So they, they protect its living mission from encroachment. So here we see the design elements of purpose and governance at work. Now, what I would say is missing in the case of the New York Times is the network of ethical practice. Mission-controlled companies, by and large, don't see themselves as a single community. They don't, uh, they don't get together in conferences uh, as cooperatives do, for example, or as employee-owned companies do. So there's a missing community of practice, which I think would really strengthen this particular model. And I'll just close by saying that that generative designs are ownership designs that when they're functioning normally, they tend to create fair and just outcomes, and they tend to benefit the many rather than the few, and they tend to promote ecological sustainability. So there you have it. 